We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 5, starting in verse 11. Um, Today we're talking about stagnation and complacency. Um, And so I think it's funny that, you know, we're also going to be talking about childishness versus childlikeness. Um, And and I think that's funny because I'm the kids pastor and they were like, hey, why don't you preach on this passage on acting like a child? And I was like, am I supposed to take that as a positive thing or a negative? I don't know. Um, But it's going to, it's going to be, it's going to be a fun passage to go through. I heard a story um, in kids ministry. I hear a lot of stories about kids, uh, but I also experience a lot about, you know, different, different types of persons and kids and whatnot. Um, And I heard a story from a mom who was pregnant at one point with her second baby. Her three-year-old son stayed at his grandma's house while she was in the hospital. And mom and dad finally were able to come home. And, um, you know, you can just imagine the excitement that they had to share that new baby girl with her older brother. Um, And so they brought her home and and, uh, imagine the situation when she got home, uh, this newborn baby sister, about two hours after observing her sweet face and and, and saying hi to her and seeing her smile and everything, uh, this older brother uh, looks at his mom and, and he says the sweetest thing he could conjure up in his mind. He says, whose baby is it? Are her parents coming back to pick her up? And this little boy, bless his heart, he was so ignorant of the fact that, man, this was his baby sister. This was his baby sister. Today, I earnestly seek that I myself would teach us nothing tonight. Um, I pray that, that nothing would come of me and that, that everything that is spoken is of the Lord. And, and my prayer is that God would use me as his vessel to proclaim his truth tonight. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into the word. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11 says, we have a great deal to say about this, and it's difficult to explain. Why is it difficult to explain? Since you have become too lazy to understand, although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness, Because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature. For those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for this day, this time that we get to jump into this text in Hebrews. Father, humble our hearts right now to receive your truth and receive your wisdom. Um, Father, we just, we we are your vessels and, and we just want to preach your truth, Father. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. As going through Hebrews for the past several weeks, I'm sure you guys have have, uh, talked about the background of Hebrews and all this good stuff, but, um, you know, the author of Hebrews is not, um, you know, known really, um, but we do know that it was uh, such a great apostolic book um, that that was a part of the canon, Um, but we do know that that the Hebrew audience was a a larger, um, probably more wealthy audience in Italy. And the big thrust of Hebrews is that Christ is superior to Judaism. Christ is superior to anything overall was the focus. But the Hebrews were the Jews, um, and and they were especially caught up in their rituals um, and their priestly system. They would go to their high priest whenever they wanted, um, you know, to talk to God. and, 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 And the writer of Hebrews was trying to help them understand that, hey, this is not necessarily the case anymore. In fact, it's not. Christ came to replace this earthly system, um, and, and though those things were good in their time period, they um, eventually, uh, you know, he gets to the point where it's like, listen, Jesus fulfilled that. At the end of chapter 4 and in the beginning of chapter 5, we discuss the priesthood and kingship of Jesus. They talk about Melchizedek, who um, was a priest and king, and how Jesus was through the line of Melchizedek, or sorry, was through the priestly um, uh, type of typology of Melchizedek. The verses that we read need to be read through the lens of what's already been spoken. That Jesus is the greater high priest because he was not through the tribe of Levi, but was through the order of Melchizedek, who was a type of him that was to come a priest and king. However, what does it say in the beginning of this passage? It says that these people, they can't understand it. Why? Why? Because they're lazy. The laziness in this, in this passage is made clear in verse 11 where it says at the end, since you have become too lazy to understand. 
And so today we're going to talk about how that if we are to be faithful disciples, we must be staunchly committed to consuming the deep nutrients necessary to grow into biblical maturity. I'm going to say that again because that's kind of a long main point. But if we are to be faithful disciples, we must be staunchly committed to consuming the deep nutrients necessary to grow into biblical maturity. But why? Why is it so important for us to consume the word of God and the deep nutrients in it? Or to ask it simply, why should I read the Bible? Why should I study the Bible? Why should I make that a daily discipline in my life? Why? Let's get into it. I've got five things tonight that we're going to talk about. And don't worry, I'm going to get us out in time. I know you hear five things. You're like, oh my goodness, it's typically three points for a Baptist preacher. Tonight we have five, but we're going to, we're going to touch on them, touch and go. All right. So we're going, to, we're going to start off with our first one. We must read and study the Bible because, number one, we gain the ability to understand deep truths. We see this in verse 11, starting in, um, in, in the first part. We have a great deal to say about this. And it is difficult to explain why, again, since you have become too lazy to understand. The writer of Hebrews begins here with a diagnosis. What's going on? What's, what's, the, what's the root issue here? What's the problem? The problem was the laziness and complacency of this people, of the Hebrews. The Hebrews had become lazy and, and they weren't able to understand the deep concepts of the scripture because of this. Well, you might ask, what deep concepts are you talking about here? What, um, what, what, what kind of things are they talking about that is difficult to explain? And, and, and what, what's the context for that? Well, we can read back in verse 2 um, how, it's, how it talks about Christ humanity and his deity and how those things go together. We can look at verse 5 and see how they were uh, talking about the fullness of the Trinity and, and, and how Christ is, uh, how the Father exalted Jesus, though Jesus wasn't exalted in and of himself, um, how the Father did that. Uh, we see also the humility and exaltation of Christ again in verse 5. Um, the declaring of him as the high priest of the order of Melchizedek right at the end in verse 10 we see these different concepts that they could not understand because they were just too lazy to get to that point. They were complacent. They had been just kind of sitting there um, and, and feasting on just the milk, as we're going to learn later. If we want to understand the deep truths of God, we need to be reading and studying it. If we want to understand the deep things that are in the Bible, which there's so much, and it's awesome, it's incredible. The, I was telling the kids uh, two Sundays ago, I was like, listen, the more we know about God, the more we want to worship God. And the more we worship God, the more we want to know about him. And so I was telling them that because it's like, as we get into the Bible, the way to understand those deep truths and to know God more and to worship him more is, is to get in the word, get in the word, read it, read it, study it. If we want to understand the deep truths, we need to be reading and studying the word of God. Secondly, we must read and study the Bible because if we're not progressing, we're regressing. If we're not progressing, we're regressing. We see that very clearly in this text in verse 11 and at the end of verse 12. The end of verse 11 again says, since you have become too lazy, the end of verse 12 um, says, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. We might get a hint into what that revelation is in chapter 6 when it says in verse 1, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teaching about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying a found, again a foundation of repentance from dead works. Is he saying there that we should not reflect on the simplicity of the gospel? No, that's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is that those things that are elementary, those are important, but man, we need to go further in our faith. We need to continue to be discipled. Those things were great for a time and for that season that we were in, but we need to continue to grow in the things that God has shown us through his word. We see very clearly in this part the symptoms. What is the symptoms of being, what is the symptoms of not having that desire in our hearts? Well, it's laziness, and it's that we need to refresh on the basic principles again. It's, it's kind of that idea that, you know, we're not diving into the deeper um, deepness and the depth of the, the scriptures. Again, Melchizedek, learning about Melchizedek and in this passage, you know, I think it's so funny that he talks about all of this different stuff, how this relates to this and is a type, how Melchizedek is a type. And, and then he goes into, he's like, listen, I know y'all aren't going to get this, but I'm going to say it anyways. So that maybe you would finally get to this point where you want to listen. But they did not. They were regressing. 
how many of us have stopped progressing? Many of us are under the illusion of progression um, because we just do a bunch of things and we think we're progressing. We're like a hamster on a wheel. You know, we're, we're working really, really hard to do different things, but we're not really getting anywhere. And sometimes that can be our life if we're not careful. We're not focused on the word of God. We're focused on whatever it is, maybe sports, clubs, things of that nature, a bunch of different stuff going on in our life. And putting that, maybe, maybe we're putting that over the Bible. Maybe we're putting that over family discipleship. Maybe we're putting that over what God has given us through his word and the deep study of his word. But the problem is when we put those things over God's word, then we begin to regress. We begin to regress. Just because we're busy doesn't mean that we're going anywhere. We can be, like I said, a hamster on a wheel doing a bunch of things. But man, studying the word of God, men praying with their wives, wives empowering their husbands to lead in family discipleship, man, things that are going on, this way, those things happen when we have a high view of God's word and a high view of scripture to the point where we're willing to say, man, we're going to put this over everything. We're going to put this over sports. We're going to put this over. Now, does that mean sports and stuff is wrong? No, it doesn't. Absolutely. Those things are great. And there's great principles that can be learned in all of that. But man, think about the power that it is for kids to see in their parents' lives. Man, we're going to put the Bible Bible first. We're going to put, what if it's in a grandparent's life where, where your grandkids see you or, or, or someone else in your community, a family, where those people look at you and say, man, they have a high view of God's word, where they put that first before anything. If we're not progressing, we're regressing. If we find ourselves under the illusion of stagnation or regressing in our faith, then it's time for us to reassess our priorities a little bit. It's time for us to look and say, okay, maybe there's something that I need to adjust here. We must read and study the Bible, thirdly, because disciple-maker is our profession. Disciple-maker is our profession. Yes, there's many things that we can say that we do. You know, um, I'm a pastor. I'm a husband. Um, I, you know, I, 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 I like to surf. I, I'm a surfer. I like to, I'm not a very good surfer, but I, I like to surf. It's fun. Um, but, but man, I, I like to do that stuff. I'm a hiker. I, I like to do Spartan races. There's all these things that could define who I am as a person, but ultimately the first thing that should define me is Christ and that I'm a Christian. Our first priority is that we're a Christian. It says by, by this time they should have been teachers. We see this in verse 12. Although by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. He's like, man, y'all should be the ones discipling further. But now you're the ones who are feasting on the milk. You should be teaching somebody else, but you're over here feasting on the milk. You should be teachers, but you're, you're just followers and learners. And yes, we should have that learning spirit in our life. But man, we should not be to that point our entire lives. By this time, they should have been teachers, but they had stayed stagnant, and they were the ones feeding on the milk of the word. Teacher there doesn't mean pastor, or it doesn't mean like just like, oh, if you're a teacher of a BSG or, or if you're a teacher, then if, you're, if you are in any way influencing anyone when it comes to God's word, when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to faith, you are a teacher. And man, it's important for us to understand that because then this text has very clear application to our lives. I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 10, 31 as I was going through this, where it says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Give no offense to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also try to please everyone and everything, not seeking my own benefit, but the benefit of many so that they may be saved. We put Christ first in our lives. One of the reasons is so that when we're glorifying God, others see that and they follow him and they're saved. A good teacher does not need, one important thing that I want to say here is a good teacher doesn't need to know the entirety of scripture in the sense that they understand every facet and concept and page and memorized everything and understand um, everything that's in Revelation and, and how that relates to, the, you know, not, you don't have to do that if you're a teacher. What I tell, um, you know, like parents, moms, and dads, 
Um, when they're talking to me, one thing I, I love to emphasize is family discipleship. We need to get in the Word of God as a family. It's just an important point, you know, whether that's on the way to the ball field or whether that's, you know, whenever you're just, you know, getting your kid ready for bed. We used to do Bible story time at night, you know, right before we would go to bed, and my mom and my dad would have us there, and we would, we'd read the Bible, we'd act it out, we'd draw it, we'd draw the story. Um, some nights we were just cramming to get it in before bed, so it was like, you know, but man, it's, it's important to do that. And something I tell you, you know, some moms and dads will be like, man, I don't know the Bible like I know I should in order to teach my kids. I, 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 what if they ask me a question I don't know? What, what, if, what if I come to a passage I don't know? I feel like I need to know more before I start teaching my kids. Let me tell you this. You just need to be one step ahead. You just need to be one step ahead. A good teacher does not need to know the whole Bible. They just need to be a few steps ahead. Any professor will tell you that when they first start, um, in the, 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 you know, the, their first class ever, they're getting ready for it. They're getting ready for that class. They're staying up late, putting all that curriculum together. But man, when that professor's tenured, they've got that stuff just rolling. They're, they're just going with it, right? Because they, they need to be ready to teach, yes, but they had to start somewhere, and we all have to start somewhere. So let's start. Jump into a passage. If you're, if you're discipling your kids or discipling somebody else, read the passage, take some time to study it, look at it, um, get ready for it in the morning, and then in the evening, teach it to your kids. Talk to them about it, you know? Share it with them. Um, and if they have questions, figure it out together, you know? I'm not telling y'all stuff you don't already know, but it's just a good reminder for all of us that, that we just need to be in the Word of God with our families. If we're to be good teachers of the Word of God in our family and community and world, we need to be studying the Word of God ourselves and keeping that intentional and reading God's Word. All right, fourthly, we must study and read the Bible because infancy results from inexperience. Infancy results from inexperience. We see this very clearly in verse 13. Now, everyone who lives on the milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness. Because why? Because he is an infant. Because he is an infant. It's important for us to take a, a quick sidebar here and, and talk about the difference between childishness and childlikeness. There's a difference between childishness and childlikeness. For childishness, that's uh, ignorance. That's what comes from willful ignorance, laziness, uh, stubbornness, pride. Um, if you're a parent, grandparent, or no, a parent or grandparent, or a kid, you've understood this before. That there's a sense in, in which that's childishness. Childishness is ignorance, willful ignorance, laziness, stubbornness, and pride. But then there's also childlikeness. And what childlikeness is, is a hunger to know more about God, a genuine faith in him, a care for others, especially those less fortunate than ourselves, and, and a desire to know more. If you've been around kids before, you know that kids ask a lot of questions. They ask a lot of, well, why is this? Well, why, how does this happen? How in the world does, does that work? You know, I, I can remember asking my dad a ton of questions, and sometimes he'd be like, I can't answer why right now. I, I just need you to obey. Um, but, but man, and probably y'all have experienced that before, but listen, like kids want to know why. Why is it like this? Why does it happen this way? And man, what if we started having that fervor and excitement and that desire to know more about the Bible that a child has? Where they're like, well, why in Genesis chapter, chapter 3, when, whenever Adam and Eve sinned, why did they do that? Why did they sin against God? Why, why was it a snake? It could have been a rhinoceros. Why was it a snake? Let's, let's, look, let's look at the passage. Kids ask these questions, and we're just like, man, I never thought about it like that before. What if we had that passion for God's word? And I know most of us, uh, and all of us do, but, but man, sometimes, I know for myself, sometimes I'll fall away from that. But I need to be reminded of myself that, man, I have got to have that sort of passion and desire to want to know more about God's word as a child does. And that's the difference. We want to be childlike, not childish. And so that's what Hebrews is saying here, as well, or the author of Hebrews is saying, is in verse 12, uh, in verse 13, now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. He's childish. Yeah, that's that laziness, not pride. I mean, they had not become teachers, though, because they had inexperience. It's not that the meat wasn't available. The meat was there. 
It's not like, well, you know, they just hadn't gotten the message yet. And so, no, the meat was there. It's like, it's like they went into Golden Corral and said, man, I'm still, wait, uh, no, probably not. Okay, it's like they went into a, a decent restaurant and said, man, there's, there's so much food here. I'm sorry, if you like Golden Corral, I apologize. But, um, but n- nonetheless, it's like going into a buffet. You go into a buffet and there's Ruth Chris steaks galore. And it's all you can eat steak, all you can eat shrimp, everything that you can eat, going in there and saying, I'll just take a water. I'm still hungry but I'll just take a water. Why am I so hungry? I'll just take a water, no ice. Why are they so hungry? Because they had the steak available, they had the meat available. The book of Hebrews was written in the late 60s AD, so maybe 67 to 70 AD, and most of the books of the Bible, well, a vast majority of the New Testament books were written by that time period. They had the whole Old Testament, but also, you know, you think about Matthew, Mark, Luke, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all those books were written during that time period, so they would have started circulating. And, and maybe and by that time, they, they probably didn't have the, the, the completed, they definitely didn't have the completed canon at that time period, but um, at that time period, they would have had these books circulating around, and they would have known. They had the stuff there. They had it there. It's just a matter of taking it, diving in, reading it, eating it up, getting excited about it. There was meat available. They just needed to take a bite. There was meat available. They just needed to take a bite. And so that's why the writer of Hebrews is admonishing them. It's like, man, we have so much here that we need to to consume and and to understand, but but are we going to do it or are we going to be lazy? Also, they had the apostles there, literally the apostles. They were there. They were on the scene. They were still alive. They were talking in the churches. I mean, you could just call up Peter. Well, you couldn't call them, but you could just reach out to Peter and be like, hey, man, explain this to me. Hey, Paul, check this out. What are your thoughts on this? You know, and they could reach out and they could, but but they weren't. Also, God, and the very important point that I want to pull out here for us is that God's put us in a time where we have so many resources available to us, like so much. Like number one, first off, that I think about is we have the completed English Bible. What? What? That is so awesome. Listen to guys like, Read guys like William Tyndale, you know, and, and John Rogers, guys that, that brought the Bible into English under the persecution of, of Bloody Mary. They, they brought the Bible in as, a, as an English language. They wrote the English language. They developed words in the English language so that we have our language today. They did all that. Uh, they were willing, willing to go to the stake to be burned for it. One quick sidebar, John Rogers, as he was walking to the stake to be burned, he asked, can I see my family and talk to my family before I die? They said no. Um, but his wife and his kids were right there. The whole church had gathered in the streets and was cheering on John Rogers as he was going to the stake to be burned because he wrote the English version of the Bible that we have today. We have this because of faithful men like that that took the word of God seriously. It wasn't like, well, you know, we could just, I mean, let's translate John and, you know, just get Matthew in there and we should be good to go. That's pretty much it. No, they translated the word of God, the Bible, the fullness of the word of God. They were excited about it, willing to give their lives for it. Man, we have the English Bible, the infallible word of God. It should be, this is sufficient in and of itself for truth. But man, talk about all the other commentaries we have from Puritans and, and from Reformers, people that have come before us and written these commentaries and, and, and men of God, men and women of God that have put these together and said, man, this is how you interpret this. I mean, think about, like, you know, you've got even like Logos. Like, Logos is a great biblical tool. Um, there's a paid version, but there's also a free version. There's study Bibles. There's Blue Letter Bible, which is completely free and has a bunch of different commentaries on it from Spurgeon and all this stuff. So think about that. We have all these resources at our disposal to learn the word of God, way more than than a poor commoner might have had in in the early, you know, third century or whatnot, or or in the 60s, in the 60s, whenever they were AD 60, not 1960, but in, in in the AD 60s, whenever he was writing this. Think about that. Isn't that cool? We have all of that available. Let's jump into it. Let's jump into it. Let's jump into it with our kids. Let's jump into it with our grandkids. Let's jump into it with our spouse. Let's do this. 
Because it's going to be awesome whenever we uncover what God's word is saying. We should have no excuse to be stagnant in our reading and studying of God's word. God's given us so many blessings, so many blessings to be able to read and study his word. The last thing, number five, we must read and study the Bible because maturity leads to discernibility. Maturity leads to discernibility. When we grow in our knowledge of God's word, we are matured to be able to discern. We discern between what's good doctrine and what's false doctrine. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself to God as an approved worker who does not need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. If you were in Awanas, you learned that verse growing up. Um, Hebrews 13, 9, which again, same, the writer of Hebrews, he writes in there, he says, don't be led astray by various kinds of strange teaching. For it is good for the heart to be established by grace and not by food regulation, since those who observe them have not benefited. He talks about these people that were coming in and saying, you should do this, you should eat this, you shouldn't eat this, all this stuff. He's like, listen, this is the word of God. Study the word of God. Learn the word of God. Do not be led astray by these strange types of teachings. I think about discernment like this, and, and he says the, the senses in verse 14, but solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained. Senses have been trained. When I think about this, I think about a heart surgeon. Imagine you're getting open heart surgery. And, and the open heart surgeon, I can only imagine kind of as, and I hope you've never had this experience, but the open heart surgeon lays you on the table and they said, hey, man, I'm so excited today. We're going to get this done. We're going to get it done quickly. Um, I know what I'm doing because I've got this list of books right here that tells me how to do a heart surgery. So, so we're just gonna, I'm just going to go through these books as I'm doing the surgery with you, and, and, and we're just going to work through this together, okay? All right, perfect. We're going to go ahead and cut you up. Oh, wait, wait. I put the anesthesiology book under the, the surgery book. Sorry. That one's supposed to come first. Let me fix that. I would be hightailing it out of there. I would be running away as fast as I possibly could. I'd pay whatever fees necessary to get out of there because that is not a good situation. Why? Because I want somebody whose senses have been trained. I don't want somebody that just knows the right things to do. I want somebody who, when something goes wrong or if something were to not go exactly as planned, he'd be like, oh, I've done this before. I don't want the guy that's done seven surgeries. I want the guy that's done 700. Why? Because his senses have been trained. And so let's think about that in our Christian life. Let's think about that in our faith. We are, just like the surgeon will naturally have an inclination to do things a a certain way and if something were to go awry or, or, or to fix something just out of intuition, in the same way in our Christian lives, we're gonna be faced with so many different things that we're gonna be up against. And if we have that discernment that God has given us through the reading of his word and the study, then we're gonna be ready to face those. A response is gonna come naturally. Uh, We're not going to have to wonder, what should I do? God is going to give us the words to say, the the thoughts to think, and the actions to do. It's just going to come natural. It's going to come natural. In the same way, we need to be well-versed in the scriptures. If we want to be discerning, then we need to be studying the word of God. Get this word of God in us. Memorize these verses. Set, Set a challenge for your family. Set a challenge for your family to memorize One verse a week, one verse a month, something. Set a goal. When you get the word of God in you, hide his word in your heart that we might not sin against God. Hide his word in our heart. The author of Hebrews has challenged us, uh, me especially, with the idea of stagnation. If we're to be faithful disciples, we must be staunchly committed to consuming the deep nutrients necessary to grow into biblical maturity. How do we do this? Number one, we gain the ability to understand deep truths. Number two, if we are not progressing, we're regressing. Number three, disciple maker is our profession. Number four, infancy results from an experience. And number five, maturity leads to discernibility. Let's go back to the heart illustration really fast, and then we'll move on. Before a surgeon has been licensed to perform the surgery, he does, um, and, and if you're medically inclined in here, I'm sorry if I messed this up, but I tried to do my research as best as possible. I will not be performing any surgery, so that, no problem. But um, nonetheless, before a surgeon's license, they have to study the books. They study the books. They work on mannequins and things of that nature. Um, they, they work on different cadavers and things of, uh, like that in order to make sure that they know what they're doing. 
But then they don't just get, to my knowledge, thrown into the operating room. All right, it's your turn to do it. It's a real person now. I know you've only worked on, on dead, deceased people, but it's time for you to go. My idea is that they have someone there with them that is an expert whose senses have been trained, whose senses have been heightened, who understands what, so if the, if the new surgeon is working and the other surgeon can come in and, 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 and be there right with him to support him, to encourage him. There has to be a point where they transition, a surgeon transitions from the cadavers to the actual human body, a living human being. He's got to have that person right next to him ready. And I tell you what, who, who is your disciple? Who is your disciple? This part excites me a lot. I'm really excited about this because I've had so many people in my life that have poured into me and have helped me to train my senses and I still need those people. Y'all are those people, thank you. But man, we've got to be training other people. I've got to be training people younger than me and, and, and younger, not necessarily age, but, but, but talking about spiritual growth and maturity, I need to be training people. I need people training me. We need people training us, those that are training us and those that we are training. We need to be training those people because it says right here that a, that a, a mark of somebody who understands God's word is one who teaches God's word. A mark of somebody who understands God's word is somebody who teaches God's word. So what are, who are we gonna pick in our lives to do that? Who is God leading us to, to disciple? If we're gonna be, again, if we're gonna be faithful disciples, we have to be staunchly committed to consuming the deep nutrients necessary in order to grow into biblical maturity. And with that, we must teach others to do the same. We must teach others to do the same. I have a whole sermon on Psalm 78 that I'm not gonna get into, but I really want to because it talks about teaching the next generation. And my heart is with the next generation. Let's teach these kids God's word. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter your life experience. Let us be an example to the next generation of what we ought to do, of how we ought to live for Christ. Maybe you, you know, maybe you're sitting here and you're like, Pastor Jonathan, I, what in the world can I start doing? Start praying for the next generation. Pray for those kids and, and up there right now. We've got about 200 kids that are just in between preschool and, and upstairs. We've got like 200 kids in there right now that are being discipled, learning about Jesus. Pray for those kids. Pray for the teachers. Pray for the teachers. Let's let, let, find ways to encourage them and support them in their role. Because they are doing the Lord's work. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. When the word of the Lord is spoken, I believe that there is a response necessary. I believe scripture commands a response. And so maybe you've never taken the step to repent and follow Jesus, and you need to do that today. Maybe under the sound of my voice, you're like, man, I want that life with Christ I, w I don't want to be an infant my whole entire life. I want to be saved. I want to come to the knowledge of the truth. I want to hold God's word. Man, take the first step today to follow Jesus. Maybe you've taken that step, but you found yourself in, in a situation of stagnation. What disciplines do you need to add to your life in order to grow in your faith? Maybe it's a daily Bible reading. Maybe it's, maybe it's adding verse memorization to your, to your rhythms. What is God wanting you to add to your life right now in order to help you to progress in your discipleship. Maybe you have those disciplines, but it's time for you to take the next step and ask somebody to mentor you or for you to go mentor someone else, for you to disciple them in the word of God, to teach them, to help them process that meat so that they can grow in spiritual maturity. Let's pray right now for that. Dear God, I pray for each and every person under the sound of my voice, including myself, Father, humble our hearts. Help us to, to be ready for your words. Please, Father, speak to me. Father, please help me to be obedient to what you want me to do. Help me to orchestrate these disciplines in my life in a consistent way. Please help me to do the things that you have called me to do to disciple those younger than me, to be discipled by those who are more mature. 
And God, I praise you for your word. I praise you for this day. I absolutely love you, Father. You've done so much for me that I do not even deserve. And I love you. And we love you. We thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen.